Hey, everybody, this is Joe Lynn Turner, and you're listening to Tom and Zeus on the Shout It Out Loudcast. Keep it locked. Keep it rocked. Oh, boy. Here we go. Boy. Stop pressing the button. Star? Simmons. Star? Paul Stanley. Is that what he does? Stop shouting. I need He's not what you would call a handsome man. Oh, no. Here come the kiss times. Is that a positive thing? Okay. All right. I'm going to grab me a nice cold mellow. Yellow. Why? Why do that to the fans? Stop it. Why? Because the fuck That's all. Six one seven five two five zero eight five. You do? Hey, fucko! Do you like kiss? Settle down. Hello, hey, what's up there, Kiss Army? Tom and Zeus, another episode of Shout It Out Loudcast, episode two ninety seven. Gene Simmons, Vault. Disc one. Yeah. Disc one of what? 400? Four, what was it? 62 <laughs> discs? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't he's know. got you say uh, 2587. Yeah. Who knows? There's a lot. He's got like demos of like 15 songs over and over and over again. So, who yeah. Knows? It's going it, to, it, it'll be, it'll be fun. Yeah. This is good. This, this could be a whole new sidecast, the Vault Experience podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually super excited to talk about this. Oh, me I've too. Been dying. To yep. get to this in disc one and uh we're going to try to do this without getting sued by gene sorry <laughs> youtube people you can't get the clips but maybe you podcast people will so yeah that's right that's why you yep. gotta subscribe to the podcast my friends yep all right well tom last week we did the kiss merch episode which has been brewing for quite some time indeed and yeah. every kiss nerd came out in their little underoos I've got this. I bought this in 1978. Whoa. Oh, my God. Uh, they enjoyed the episode. So let's get to the poll, Tom. What was our poll from last week? Yep. So we asked, which of these classic items is your favorite? The Kiss Don Russ trading cards, the pinball machine, the Mego dolls, action figures, or the classic lunchbox? 55% picked the pinball machine, 19% with the Don Ross cards, 15% with the Mego dolls, 11% with the lunchbox. This was great feedback, especially for me. I'm a collecting dork, so I love the feedback from a lot of people, especially the people that sent in pictures of their collections, which is fucking awesome. Uh, Derek Rolando, I have some of the Don Ross cards with the stale half-century-old chewing gum. I still kind of want the Kiss dolls, but since Kiss figures have regularly come out since the 90s, I've tempered down. I remember being excited to get that first set of Todd McFarlane figures. Yeah, I have one of those too, Derek. I remember the cards. You said Donruss. There was a card shop on Warren Street. You remember Warren Street is right down the street from where you went to high school at AC. Yeah, Hall's Nostalgia. No, not Hall's. Hall's oh, that, was the great one. There that was, was another the one, one I, around the oh, corner. Okay. And there was a, a local dork. That uh, had the card shop with his dad. He would come yeah. after school and go, Dad, Dad, where the Dunruss? Like, <laughs> Dude, it's not Dunruss. Hey, kid, you, know, you like the uh, Dunruss? What do you think of the Dunruss cards? Do you have the Mattingly Dunruss rookie card? I'm a big fan of the tops and the Fleer, but the Dunruss, I really like the Dunruss. Dunruss. Hall's nostalgia. Oh, Yo, yeah. Hall's, that place is full of degenerates. Dude, I used to ride my bike there and spend any money I had. Oh. And I used to try to collect all the Red Sox sets. I used to oh. love those, like, Bruins cards. Oh, oh. The place is awesome. Yep. Back to some stuff here. Our buddy Brian Krieger. For me, it was the Mego figures. As a little boy, it was a thrill for me to have my own kiss. One day they could be doing a concert on the mini tank stage that my dad built for me. The next day they would join forces with Batman and Spider Man to <laughs> battle the bad guys. Oh, yes. They'd be banging Barbie and Wonder Woman and uh, Batgirl. And Barbie and maybe Ken. I don't know. It oh. depends on what kind of dolls you have. Uh, Jason Rocco, not to be confused with Louis Rocco. <laughs> the Holy Grail is the pinball machine. So that gets the. That, so that'll get the most votes. But as a kid, and basically most adults, that thing is out of reach. My vote is for the cards. 
whether it's Kiss or Garbage Pail Kids, collectible cards are always fun and accessible. Garbage Pail Kids. I used to have those. Dude, I remember the one for Tom. It was peeping Tom, and it was a guy, <laughs> and it was a guy with eyes all over his body. I'm like, that's nice. I got a sex offender for a garbage pail kid. Oh, Jesus. Let's see what people think of the episode in general here. More comments. Davo says, remember that Kiss Motorbikes by Honda, as far as I know, didn't make production. And I said, yes, and I actually have a poster of that framed. Yes, uh, it's one of my proud prized possessions. Aggie Dad and Tiger Grad, love the topic. I'm a sucker for Kiss merch. My favorite are the Dunruss cards. And the, <laughs> the, the Dunruss card. And the two cards I punched out of the back of a Twinkies box. What? Uh, I had somebody make a custom frame for the cards to create that infamous puzzle poster. Hey, yes, that's right. The, uh, the the baseball cards the, on the back side of them, you could build a puzzle. It was a freaking awesome Love Gun era photo. Ken and Satan service. Great episode. My favorite were the training cards. Nowadays, I go for the beaten up merch. It's more about nostalgia and a lot cheaper. And then he posts a picture of one of his display cases. Got some cool shit in there. Some eight tracks, comic books, VHS, kiss dolls. Love that stuff. Such a dork for that. Uh, Vet Halen says, holy shit, Tom, what an epic story about Bill coin. Yes. Tom, you got a lot of love on that, on that story, yeah. buddy. A lot of love. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's a good one. I've been saving it for a while to make it kind of relevant to an episode. So, uh, and then we'll. Yeah, finish you didn't tell. You, you didn't finish the other part where Bill Coin uh, took me to the other bathroom, <laughs> and I was and I walked out a little funny afterwards. About twenty minutes later, I don't know. I was crickets, only seven years old. I don't crickets, know what happened. Crickets, 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 crickets. <laughs> and Sean Delaney took Murph, and Murph's never been the same. That explains everything. Okay, I get it now. Oh, God. All right. Uh, do, do with that as you please. Uh, we'll finish up Twitter with JD, who sends a picture of that epically legendary trash barrel that I talked about, the metal trash can, which is <laughs> for some reason a collector's item. But anyways, that's what we got on the Twitter machine. Tom, I finally got my AirPods to work. Yay. Wonderful. Uh, Bobby Kenner. Another awesome episode, boys. Really cool to dive into the Kiss merch world. You could definitely spend a fortune on just non-music stuff. I own a lot of the Kiss comics from over the years. That's one we didn't talk about, honestly, because I'm not a Kiss comic book collector. Me neither. I'm not a th- comic no. book collector. No, I, I never I, got into them. Ne- me neither. Up. I think I think I just have one nerd, them, and it was like a reprint. Like, yeah, I don't have any of those. I, I, did you ever buy comics? Nope. Never got into yeah, it. Never got into it either. I don't know. No, I was, I, I was, I was too busy going. going men still buying comics. Dude, I was too busy going into Medford Square to Devlin's smoke shop and trying to get a oh. glimpse at the porno mags. <laughs> hey, hey, can you give me, can you give me that? I'm looking for the Christmas issue of Jugs. If you can pull that oh. back behind the, the cash register for me. I'm just trying to goose little sixth grade girls wearing parachute <laughs> pants. I'll take that issue of uh, Shaved if you can get that one for me too, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, he writes that I've recently been working on completing the Destroyer model collection. Yeah. I am by no means a hardcore collector, but I love it. I bet Ace would appreciate some kiss depends if they made those. Woo! Shit, shit, Paul. I need some depends for my next shows. Help a brother out. I gotta stop the splatters. <laughs> oh God. Those are his words, not mine. Anyway, uh Kevon Japson. Giggity, 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 giggity. Yes, I love merch. Still have my Kiss toy guitar I got as a little kid. The story about Tom's dad with Bill O'Coin, he has head blown emojis. I will drop a couple pics. Some of my retarded obsession. You mean Kiss Tarded obsession? Kiss Tards rejoice. The pinball machine is in there somewhere. Dude, his collection is for all the crap we give Kevin, we love him. He has a legitimately incredible collection. Like he has fucking everything that you would want it's awesome why does he have that why do you have that jepson oh i mean everybody's got a a million things here yep um i'll be here all fucking day if i started reading all this stuff oh yeah ryan ramaswamy fucking nimrata (laughs) tulik lane simmons tweed kinchan kentanji brown comey barrett fucking I, I don't know. I don't fucking know. Whatever. 
Wow, great story, Tom. I think we all wish we had something in the past we get rid of over lost time. Being a teen in the early 2000s, I had the weird merch from the stores like Spencer's or Sam Goody, too. I wish I had that stuff. Two musts you guys mentioned is Rio's Kiss World in the book, The Hottest Brand in the Land. I flipped through it all the time. I went to Kiss World last year, and it was overwhelming with all the memorabilia they had. It was amazing. And he has a question that we might just be using, so I'm going to stop there. Over on Loudcasters, and as I'm you know scrolling to find the Loudcaster post, is because everybody posts separate posts about their merch. Put it under the episode merch so we don't have 40 different posts about the same episode. Ugh. Sound like an old bitch. I know. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Throne. Hey, Zeus. That scent from the Kiss cards is still stuck in my nose, too. It was the perfect blend of cardboard and shitty gum. <laughs> I'm pretty sure my mom sold mine at a garage sale somewhere in the 80s. Yeah. Isn't that true of everybody? Darren Hunt puts a great photo of him in his, uh, I think, Ace Frehley 78 Halloween costume. Yep. He's not wearing a mask. His face was painted. Oh, even better. Nice. Uh, Frank Anzalone. It's going to be an awesome Saturday. 15 pounds of Boston butt on the smoker. Ooh, College football. <laughs> oh, different kind of Boston butt. Okay. okay. I like fat chicks. <laughs> uh, finishing up, raise your glasses and Yankee baseball tonight. Fuck that. You what? It now. Yankee yeah. baseball. Fuck. Come on, man. I always like to say, name me the time the Yankees won the World Series without having the highest payroll. Um, anyways, best of listening to this episode while drinking some of Sam's Oktoberfest in my new Shout It Out Loud cast koozie. Yeah. Cheers. Anyways, um, he's displaying his new koozie that he got because he is either a, I believe, a star child or demon tier member. Mm -hmm. And so the new merch is getting mailed out to everybody that is a member of our Patreon. So come on in and join up. Yep. Daniel Hall of Houston says, and I believe he was on our last Patreon call, wasn't he? That's right. He indeed was. Put a face to the famous name. Uh, Vinny and Ace's storage is one of the highlights of my weeks. I can't (laughs) wait till they try to fit some of Paul's art with some other items. (laughs) Push over the dead Shih Tzu. I got a (laughs) fucking art distributed from Paul. He drew a picture of Jimi Hendrix for the 100th time, and he told me I could score it here. (laughs) I don't believe we can move any more pets over. (laughs) Uh, The great Joey Romanek, I hope he's not blown away into the ocean. Oh, yeah, Jesus. Stay stay, uh, safe over there in Tampa. I hope he can listen Um, to this episode, for God's sakes. Put a photo up of some cabbage soup that Ace must have been having. (laughs) Yuck. <laughs> Cabbage soup goes right through me like a sewer pipe. Oh, God, what a laxative. Brutal. <laughs> I just relaxed in the hot tub. Next thing you know, it's cabbage soup diarrhea. <laughs> oh, God. Over on, over on YouTube. Uh, Chris Flood. Well, it was solo merchandise, so I know why it wasn't mentioned. Ace really. He's Fraley's kitty litter tray for whatever you have to rip it out. And Ugh. Gene Simmons baking grease lube. So when that bigger cushion needs more pushing. <laughs> That's awesome. Last night I was with this chick and she let a couple of them rip out. Ooh. <laughs> <Frank. laughs> Rip one out. Ooh, I got some gas. You want (laughs) it now? Smell my ass. Oh, God. Here we go. Marty White. Merchandise. Better grab a meatloaf sandwich before I listen to this one. Wonder who he's talking about. And, Tom, before I I pass it back to you, just want to give you a heads up. A couple of our listeners uh, listened to our wish list and offered some of them to us. Yes. Holy shit. So unbelievable. Uh, thank you. Uh shout out goes to AJ White and to Jason. Don't call me Loe Rocco uh for your generous donations. 
uh, for some things on the gift list. Much appreciated. You guys are the best. Fucking loudcasters, man. Yeah, that's amazing. That's so yeah. cool. Thank you. Now, those two go on the cool list for the week. The rest of you shitbags, I don't know. No, oh, you guys. you're out. <laughs> you're we all love out. you all. We love you all. Uh, Tom, back to you, buddy. All right. Let's go over to Instagram here. And right. our our buddy Junior Vintage says, that's gold, Jerry. Gold. The story of your dad knowing a coin gave me goosebumps. Kudos to keeping that secret till almost 300 episodes. P.S. I'm so glad to know I am not the only Kiss Tar that loves the smell of the old Kiss cards. Yes. Kiss cards for Kiss Tards. Cards with the Tards. Radio Chaos. Loving the show, mates. The Ace Pant shitting sketches have me in hysterics every week. Is there some way you guys could incorporate Joe Walsh into these? As I'm sure he would have similar challenges in his life. By the way, love the Midnight Special episode. I got Dave? one for you, Tom. Okay. I got to add Joe White now. Joe White. Joe Mana. Joe Mana. Joe Walsh. Next I know. Ace just pulls his pants down and takes a dump on the stage. You don't see things like that anymore. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> Dave Rockstar says, my first ever Christmas gift that I got was a plastic Paul Stanley mask from Santa. I think I was about four years old, but I can still remember it. So the kiss masks are my favorite merchandise. P.S. My mom wasn't even a fan, but she bought it for me because I used to be both terrified and excited when I saw them on TV. Ditto, Dave. Ditto. I was terrified of them as a little kid. Oof. And let's finish up here with a few emails here. Got one here from our good friend and Loudcaster Hall of Famer, Jim Riley. Since 2019, I have purchased more SIOL merch than KISS merch. I have a modest amount of Kiss merch from over the years. My favorite is when people who I know like Kiss get me some merch as a gift. They're great. Some people do not know how valuable these gifts are. One of my greatest is a Kiss Alive vinyl signed by the original members. Wow. P.S. Wow. Tom's father knew the fifth member of Kiss. Yes, Jim. Pretty cool stuff there. And next, we go to Rick Hickey. This is coming from our website, shoutoutloudcast.com. When you message us on that, we get that in the form of an email. So thank you, Rick. Tom and Zeus, thanks so much for another excellent episode. Really enjoyed the merch topic, as it's something that every single KISS fan has been affected by in some way, shape, or form. It's been a long time since given away to an old friend of mine, but I used to have an Ace Freely jack-in-the-box. <laughs> Push a button on the front, and the spaceman springs out in his Destroyer album cover pose while the box plays shouted out loud. I was waiting for a joke there, but apparently it's a real item. Uh, I'm thinking we need a new version of that. 21st century Ace Fraley springing out of Tom's shed. Love the show. Keep up the good work. And we're going to wrap up feedback here with one from our buddy Gino Dvorak. Great episode, guys. So much merch to talk about. When I was a kid, I wanted a Kiss lunchbox so bad, but I never had the money. So one day, my mom came home from a garage sale saying, I bought you a lunchbox you might like. My excitement was short-lived when she showed it to me. And it was a Bee Gees lunchbox. <laughs> this is even better. I ended up taking a black marker and drawing Gene's makeup on Barry Gibbs' face. <laughs> I never got one until a few months back when my girlfriend surprised me with one she found locally for a really low price, thermos included. I sat and stared at it for an hour, really took me back. I remember hearing, and I think it was Chris Jericho talking about the color forms, and he accidentally called them chloroform. <laughs> Then he goes, P.S. Spaceman depends. Bachelorette number two. What's on your mind? Never mind. I know something stinks, right? Sorry. I changed my depends before the show, but I was in such a hurry. I put on a clean pair before my ass was wiped out. Ah. Now, Gino, that email just includes everything we love. Your passion for the show, your excitement for the show, your funny story about the lunchbox, the facts that you're a merch tard, and of course... Ace jokes with our favorite bachelorette, which is bachelorette number two for some reason. <laughs> but Gino, my friend, you are the comment of the week. Good answer. Good answer. I like the way you think. I'm going to be watching you. 
Tom, what we do next is we go and give a proper thank you to our Patreon family. Uh, Patreon is where people can subscribe, give a monetary contribution to the show, base that upon four different tiers, and in turn, get different perks back. Each tier, uh, the higher the perk, uh, based upon which if you go to a higher tier. So obviously we have four different tiers based upon Demon, Star Child, Spaceman, and Catman. And those tiers uh, give you different perks. So you can get merch. You can get uh, involvement. You can get uh, a n- numerous uh, video chats. You get uh, the ARC pick. You get polls. You get a, a ton of stuff. And uh, Patreon has been a huge help to us. We really appreciate your support. If you've been thinking about it a while, it's a great way to come in. Get into the Patreon family and support this show. Uh, go to shoutitoutloudcast.com. Right on the landing page is Patreon. Or you can go to the Patreon app and you find Shout It Out Loudcast under the creators. Subscribe. Help out the show. Become part of the Patreon family. And thank you to all our fucking awesome Patreon family members. Patreon, you guys rock. Thank you so much. And I always say it, whether you're brand new to the party, you've been there since day one or somewhere in between, it doesn't matter. Your generosity and your support of the show means the world to us. So please, please, thank you so much. And check us out. Click on the link on our website at shoutoutloudcast.com and join the family. Tom, we go over to Kiss World. Uh, a couple things going on there now. Dude, just <sighs> fucking Gene Simmons goes on <laughs> Dancing with the Stars. And breaking news, you little whiny twats from this fucking pussy bitch generation. Gene Simmons was Gene Simmons. And unbelievable. Every headline here. Gene Simmons facing backlash due to comments made during Dancing with the Stars appearance. One person tweeted, Gene Simmons' comments about the ladies are given the energy of the gross uncle who corners you at the reunion. Another person wrote, he is seriously sucking all the energy out of the ballroom with his creepy comments about the female dancers. Welcome to the world of Gene Simmons, you stupid fucks. What did they think was going to happen when you had him on the show? I'm not defending his behavior. It's Gene Simmons. It's like, you know, like sticking your arm in the mouth of a pit bull and wondering why it bit you. That's what pit bulls do. This is what Gene Simmons does. Okay. Bad idea to have him on. It was a stupid fucking TV show with a hair metal theme. He was a judge and he was being Gene. He said stuff like, this is a brand new experience. Well, hold on. This is a brand new experience for me. And it's difficult to look at you and to figure out which one is more hot, hot hot i mean he says uh that's offensive so uh, actress chandler kinney he says chandler you fogged up my glasses i don't know what to tell you you move me not just with your gyrations and so on but your beautiful face and how you're into the emotion of it i like this e news has reached out to reps for simon and abc for comment and has not heard back Go fuck yourself times 10. Unbelievable. Well, there, this is there so were other easy. things that they were saying he was racist because he gave one of the black contestants a lower grade than some of the uh, dance judges. And they're always like, well, all the celebrity judges usually give a higher uh, score than the the real judges. And he gave a lower score than they did to the oh, black. So it's got to be race. It's got to be race. It's got to be race. It's the only way it would be. It's got to be race. There's no other reason. So he got backlash on that. I mean, come on, people. What are it, we doing? It's fucking Gene Simmons on a stupid goddamn TV show that a bunch of twats watch. So I haven't said twat in so long. I just said it three times in five minutes. It's just so good. ridiculous. Uh, Bruce did another video. We love Bruce's videos talking about some of his favorite albums that he worked on. Uh, anytime Bruce does anything, we love it. So, of course, that's great. Uh, other than that, you know, uh, kind of quiet or, you know, same stuff we say every week. Not much going on. Gene's Hold keeping on. the kit. Gene's Hold keeping on. the. Uh oh. Uh oh. Zeus is chiming in with something. Yeah, Go ahead, brother. Well, last week it, we didn't mention it, but Paul put the video up of his wife on the couch barefoot. They love to be barefoot on couches. I don't get that. Ugh. His beautiful wife was interviewed as part of a five-part documentary on the final tour. 
five part. <laughs> Here's the same 20 did, songs we did. Did you hear what our buddy Don Jameson tweeted out? He goes, of course, it's five parts. One part for every year of the end of the road tour. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, though, there were a lot of things that happened on that tour from deaths to COVID yeah. Yeah. to bands members getting sued to his ace and them coming back to the yep. end of the road, New York to the avatars. To, there was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. You know? So I, I, I get it. But, uh, and I think that's the first time his wife has become public. I've he never, ever. The only time we ever see her is when he posts a family picture. That's it. Never seen yeah. her anything involved with kids. She looks a little different. She used to be really bug eyed, but Wicked. here she looks a little different. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, but God bless him. He wants to bring up his wife. I, I have no problem with it. She's not. No, no, not at all. That's fine. She's not hogging the limelight. Like this is my girlfriend. She, she's the inspiration for Cherry Madison. God. Hey, by the way, real quick, has there ever been an album that just came and went quicker than ten thousand volts? <laughs> that was like a fucking fart in the wind. That album. Oh my god! No one says a word about that anymore. Yeah. Oh, no. Why not? It's a great one. Oh god. Anyway, I I think that's just about it. Um, let's take a quick little break. Uh, when we come back, um, Vinny is. Uh, we're gonna follow Vinny live as he goes into the. Uh, clerk's office to try to get a business certificate for the newest addition to Fraley and Cusano storage. <laughs> hey, Vinny, don't tell him about the dogs, would you? I will keep that between us. Okay, so we're back, and now there's a whole new bit of drama here. You mentioned Freely and Cusano. Hey, fuckos, what about me? What happened to Chris and Cusano? <laughs> You fucks let me out to hanging out to dry now. Yeah, they, more, they filed more, more, uh, more drama. They filed a notice of dissolution. They shut that business down. It didn't make I, it. I don't even know what that means. It sounds like it's pretty important. <laughs> Vinny, let me know when you find out what it means. Why you're dissoluting all those dogs. <laughs> Why you doing that? Let me dissolute some of this <laughs> greasy cheeseburger I just had for lunch. Oh, oh, it's stuck. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Scout. Oh, Jesus, that kibble was really good. Hey, Tom, it's getting pretty chilly out. I promise I'll pick up my dookie if you let me in. I need, I need to get some fucking warmth in here. It's freezing outside. Uh, he's right. Southern New Hampshire's getting a bit nippy now here in mid-October. Yeah, and he needs the, you know, space. <laughs> I don't live in Florida, but, you know, I'm, not, I'm like a, a refugee from the war. I need a place to live. Oh. <laughs> or Ace. Poor Ace. But we're talking about a different Kiss member today. We're talking about Gene Simmons and Gene Simmons' vault. Yeah. So there are 250 uh, CDs as part of the vault. <laughs> we're doing disc one. And uh, I've been listening to this one quite a while. I need to, like, Me too. 15 songs. I really, I've been listening to this for months. Me not too. Well, consecutively. Not to I would play it here and there and just play it. And by the time now we're doing this episode, I know the songs. No, I'm the I same was, way. I don't. I've never heard any. Yeah, I've never. I've never heard any of this before. I, I mean, none of it. Well, with the exception of a few that appeared on albums, but this stuff, no. So you're right. If, if anytime we do any kind of review, especially something brand new, you got to spend your entire time on it, and we'll let everybody know what we think about that at the end. Yeah. So with the vault, we don't have to do talk about album covers. It's the no. same. They're just discs. There's a big book that comes with it, which we will read from as we do each of these songs. Yeah. 15 tracks. The thing about the vault is it's not chronological, which so I love. you're not starting from 1968. Gene's first ever demo of something. This is all over the map and uh, various eras, various things. Um, and uh, since there are 15 tracks, we want to keep you guys waiting too long. We'll get right into the music. I mean, it, seriously, though, The Vault itself came out, I think, November of 2017. The Vault itself consists of 10 CDs. One is a bonus CD, so 11, basically. 151 songs, basically demos. Came out in November 2017. Since there's so many tracks, we don't want to waste too much time. By the way, the label is Rhino. 
So yep. that's a different one. Yep. Uh, and I think you can still buy the vault for about 500 bucks. I think well, it's worth it. And, to be and, honest with you. and coming off the heels of our merch episode, this is a fucking, what a merch item this is for a Kiss fan. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, uh, let's get right to it and start with track number one. And that's this. So we start with, are you ready? This song right off the bat, you're like, how is this not on an album? You know, how how did this not make it on Monster or Sonic Boom? Uh, apparently, this came out around 07, 08. And again, it's with Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer. Uh, we're gonna, you're going to hear those names repeated again. I think this is just a ton of fun. I think it's a ton of fun, and I can't believe it wasn't on a Kiss album. I think it would have fit perfectly on kind of like the party vibe of Monster uh, or even Sonic Boom. I think it's a really fun song. And I think Gene is uh, playing this uh, as part of his set list on his Gene Simmons band tour. He plays it once in a while. So um, I think it's a great way to kick it off. And I mentioned earlier, I love that the vault is not chronological, that it's just a big shuffle. I think that's great. And this is a killer way for it to start. Are you ready? It's written by Gene Simmons. Tom, uh, I'm going to read from the book. Sure. Are You Ready came very fast and began on an acoustic guitar. Usually I watch TV and there's always something in my hand. Food, unfortunately, sometimes musical instruments, a bass, acoustic guitar. I also have a piano at home and I'll tinkle on that. I hear something in my head because almost always an idea, melody, lyrical, chordal passage starts to formulate in my mind. So Are You Ready started with an idea. I start tap my foot, then I put these chords against it, and I actually reference calling Dr. Love. Are You Ready was not written for any particular album. Often when I sit down and start writing, it's for nothing in mind, just a stream of consciousness. Whatever happens, happens. As I mentioned in Kiss, I usually have 30 to 40 new songs for a Kiss album. Then we all sit down and everybody says, oh, I hate that. I hate that. I hate that. Then you whittle down to three or four songs. They wind up on the record. On a free afternoon, Tommy Thayer, Eric Singer, and I cut Are You Ready live as a trio. And that's all of us on the background. Nice. Love it. So my thoughts, I think it's a good riff. I think the lyrical delivery is just so strange. Oh, it is. You can definitely. Yeah. And you can stick it where the sun don't shine. And let your backbone slip. Again, with once that. again, he used that lyric. Loves let your it. Backbone slip. Oh, my Loves God. it. Um, yep. I think you could tell that's Tommy on guitar. And it's oh, a yeah. very Sonic Boom for me. It sounds it's like a Kiss song. Yeah, it sounds like right off Sonic Boom 2007, 2008. Yeah. It's a great way to start the album. So you're like, oh, shit. This yep. isn't just fucking My Uncle's a Raft. 150 no. versions of it. No. All right. Let's go to song number two. Turn to Stone. This came out around 1993. Gene submitted this for the Psycho Circus album. Uh, the intro of the song is recorded on a tape recorder in a hotel room, and then the song kind of flips the script and goes into a a, a regular song here. Uh, and Gene was talking about the biblical phrase about Lot and his wife, don't turn around and look at Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. Otherwise, your wife will turn to stone, a pillar of salt, as they say. The song is a double entendre. I saw her walk into a room, smelled her cheap perfume. Gene loves that line. Same stuff that happens to guys all the time. We're ill-prepared for the female of the species. I always liked the Delta Blues and could never figure out the voicing on the guitars. And then I started fooling around on an electric Schechter guitar, and the riff started to come to, into my mind. Very ZZ topish, and the song wrote itself. I turned to Stone as just Tommy Thayer and myself in a demo studio, very primitive, and the words came out very fast. I turned to Stone starts off with me talking. The speaking part reminded me of how much I like sometimes that the singer talks in the old R&B songs. And I do it a few times in Kiss songs, Domino, Christine 16, and a few others. For this box set, I wanted to show how songs are born. I recently found some of these hotel writing cassette tapes, which can give you a sense of how stuff happens. It's one of the many songs in the box set that features snippets from recordings that I did on my small cassette player in hotels while on tour with Kiss. I'm in a hotel somewhere, and there's nobody around, and hopefully the Do Not Disturb sign is still on the door so the maids don't come knocking. Here I am by myself strumming an unplugged electric guitar. I press the record button on my cassette player, and whatever came out came out. Some became songs. Some ideas never became songs. Uh, yeah, it's it's a good song. I th- I think it's pretty good. I mean, it's another song that, you know, I don't know if it would necessarily fit on a Kiss album, but I like it. 
I mean, right now we're two for two on songs that I was pleasantly surprised because I thought these were going to be dump jobs, like some of the shit we got on the box set, you know, like Lita and, you know, that like stop, look to listen and that kind of stuff. I know that was Wicked Lester Kiss shit, but uh, so far I like what I'm hearing. You know, I think this is pretty Good. decent. So Turn to Stone, Gene Simmons, uh, February 93. I heard that this one came out so you can kind of hear. I like the acoustic beginning. It sounds like the street giveth. Yeah, dun, okay. Dun, 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 that acoustic beginning that he goes into it. And then he goes into Gene talking a la Domino. Uh, I think the guitar is really funky. And then he goes yep. and then he goes into Gene's ooh, yeah, oh, ooh my darling, yep. I want to make love to you kind of moods. Get that like ooh. And then fun. <laughs> yep. I think it, the chorus is pretty fun. Hot as a rock now, baby, stiff as a bone. Ooh. And I like and I like this tone of voice when gene sings yeah like it's, it's like a, that singing voice a little sexy trying to yeah. be a little ooh, yeah oh my darling i want to yeah. make love to you yep. let's go to track number three juliet uh, right off the bat this sounds like the beginning of custard pie by the zeppelin it's like da -da 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 -da. Nah, nah, nah. I mean, right there, you can you can hear the Zeppelin takes on that. And this came out right around 93, 94. The next few songs are kind of in that family. They were co-written and recorded with uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Ken Tamplin at their home studio. A lot of drum machine stuff here. You can obviously tell that's not a real drummer. Uh, I think it's a pretty cool song. I, you know, I mean, it's it it's clearly a demo. But if you wanted to work on it, then maybe could have been something there, Zeus. Juliet, written by Gene Simmons and Ken Tamplin. Gene writes, Juliet came very fast. It was being considered for Kiss's revenge album with uh, Bob Ezrin worked with us, but it didn't make it. I met Ken Tamplin, who had a band I was interested in the early 90s. Who we wrote a bunch of tunes together. I had, I had an idea about Juliet. I told them a joke about going through middle America and going past Romeoville. And, of course, the next town over was Joliet. And for, which is right down from Romeoville. And I'm going Romeo and Juliet. Get it? And then, as I said, Juliet, I like the way it rhythmically sat on the top of the phrase as a triplet kind of feel. So the chords came very fast. That's Tamplin on guitars. I wrote the lyrics and melody. And that uh, he and I are doing backing vocals. There's no drummer on the song. We used a drum machine. Yeah, you can well, totally tell. This is to me uh, just song that's kind of there. Absolutely right that this is a custard pie Zeppelin riff. Yep. Uh, but I found this song to be pretty generic, not a good chorus at all. And the do 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 doesn't help. No, <laughs> the song. So, and this came out of I think ninety three, ninety four. Yep. Anyways, yep. let's go to song four. Hey you again. Written and recorded with Ken Tamplin right around the same time frame. Um, again, the drum machine kind of ruins it for me. It's kind of like a a party song. I mean, I don't. I'm not sure if it would ever be a Kiss song. But Gene says, "Hey, you" was another tune that Tamplin and I wrote at his home studio. It started off as a Tamplin riff and a feel, and then my words and melody came later. I didn't have a thematic idea, so they're just hastily written words I threw up against the wall to see what rhymed. Hey, you. Hey, everybody. Songwriters have used the Hey You tool before. There was even a song called Hey Everybody by Tommy Rowe, who had hits with Dizzy and Sweet Pea. Everybody uses the same tools. That's it's okay. I mean, maybe, maybe could it have been turned into something? I don't know if it could have been turned into a Kiss song, but it's it's fine. It's it's fun. Hey You, written by Gene Simmons, Ken Tamplin. There's a lot of bass on this. Oh, yeah. But when you hear the boom, 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 boom. It sounds like the music that was playing is very distinct in my head. When Bender was sneaking around. Yes. When he was sneaking around in Breakfast Club, nice climbing call. on the ceiling tiles and he falls through. Yep. That's what I was thinking of. That's a good call. Um, I like it. I just put this as like a better version of Juliet. Oh, yeah, and definitely. I agree. There's yep. a lot of gang vocals on this. And then yep. you get the solo and then back into the bass line. That is great. Give us the chocolate cake. <laughs> Friday night at eight. Don't want to be, wanna be so late. late. <laughs> Don't be late. Let's go to the fifth song. I confess. Okay. Everybody knows this one because it made its way onto Carnival of Souls. 
Uh, this version is a little bit different, not as uh, mean and nasty and aggressive, but I like it. I, I, it's cool. I mean, again, the drum machine is a very, very poor substitute for Eric Singer, obviously. Um, but I, I, I like demos of songs that turned into songs that I love and I love, I confess, off Carnival of Soul. So this this was this was cool. I, I, I kind of enjoyed this one. Gene Simmons and Ken Tamplin, I confess. Uh, Gene writes, I confess it was written with during the Tamplin period. It was recorded by Kiss. It was one of the 20 or 30 songs I wrote that went into the pot for consideration on Carnival Souls album. This is the original demo with Ken Tamplin and myself doing all of it. In my youth, I remember seeing the Hitchcock movie, I Confess, starring Montgomery Cliff, which I love. And I know I put that to you. And you the got me to watch was, it, and it's fucking yeah, awesome. Yeah. The premise was about a father confessor. This is who you confess your sins to. But who does the father confess confessor confess his sins to? It's about a Catholic priest who can't sleep at night. He's listening to all these people confessing their sins, but doesn't have anybody else to talk about his problems. And I thought the idea was a compelling one for a song. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think I ranked this number one when I did uh, Carnival Souls. This is okay. a different version, not the exact mm-hmm. version. It's still a very good version of it. It's not as good as the more polished one and uh, Toby Maguire produced one. But, you know, and I, I think I, I echo your comment about this is a little less haunting than yeah. the one on Carnival Soul. It's still a good um, song. Gene's delivery is just awesome when he goes to the smooth vocals and then to the demon vocals. Oh, it's it's amazing. I in, love the, it. in the in the pre-chorus chorus part. Yep. Right. Yep. All right. Let's go to this track. I think it's a little familiar. Yep, this is Legends Never Die. We covered this in the Creatures box set, one of those discs. I was never, I wasn't a fan of it. It's the same version. You know, Wendy O. Williams did it for her Wow album. Uh, Eric Carr, you know, has got some drumming credits. Mickey Free, we, Gene mentions Mickey Free. Uh, there's about four paragraphs from the Vault you don't book need to read it all. on this song that we are not going to read uh, because we did cover this on the Creatures thing. And as I said at that episode, I'm just not a fan. Yeah, it's basically Gene shitting on the plasmatics and saying, I will do this song for you, but get rid of your band. Yeah. You're not yep. up to snuff. Right. Uh, use my guys. Anyway, yep. uh, Legends Never Die, written by Gene Simmons, Adam Mitchell, Mickey Free from the Chappelle show and the Prince <laughs> basketball game. It's just, uh, I was just like, we just did this on Creatures Disc 3 on the box set. Uh, as we talked about then, it's on the WoW album. King Cobra did a version. Doro did a version. I am the Doro. Doro Pesh. <laughs> King Cobra. I think I hooked up with Doro one time in the back of a, a back of a Chevy in 1992. <laughs> I like that show. Isn't that that little girl Doro the Explorer? <laughs> different, different, that different. Is that the same thing? I was telling her, where's her dead monkey sticks oh, in it? <laughs> oh, your monkey died. Ooh. Vinny, help me. Anyways, I think, you know, as I said then, I said Gene does a good vocal delivery. That's Mickey Free on the acoustic guitar. Nice background vocals. Decent song. I just don't know where it would fit. Maybe uh, Creatures like we talked about, but I don't even know if it fits there. I don't think it definitely doesn't fit on Creatures. Yeah. I don't know if, it, if anything, it might, might have maybe it'd fit on his 78 solo album. Yeah, maybe. maybe. All right, let, let's go to the next one. Something Wicked This Way Comes. This came out around 88, originally considered for Hot in the Shade. He does this with Bruce Kulick on lead guitar. Uh, Gene says the title idea came from a book by Ray Bradbury, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Started as a title first that always sounded ominous to me. The title didn't feel or sound like a ballad, so that told me where to go with it. I started jotting down ideas on pieces of paper like bullets in a gun. You know, you need ammunition. Every night I have the strangest feeling. I'm in my bed, and every night I have the strangest dreams running through my head. I don't know what it means. I'm feeling stranger and stranger. She lives in my dreams, and I'm feeling danger. She pulls the trigger, and I'm the bullet coming out of the gun. The words are kind of ominous and semi-dreamy. Sometimes when you get scared in the middle of the night, you don't always know what you're scared of. Sometimes it's just the dark. I tried recording Something Wicked This Way Comes a few times with different styles. I tried playing all the instruments with a drum track on an old Tascam cassette four-track machine. Then I re-recorded it a few times with Bruce Kulick. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, Uh, yeah, I don't like it. 
Um, it it just it, it doesn't really. It's plotting. It's he's he's that. This to me is like a true demo of you trying something and hoping it works. And this is just not a good one for me. This is uh, something wicked. This way comes Gene Simmons, nineteen eighty eight. I Adoro recorded this song too. Yep. I will record this song and then I will bang Ace and Paul afterwards. <laughs> she ain't lying. <laughs> Wash your teeth. You just had some Doritos. Ooh, your breath is dead. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> anyway, I, I like it. I feel like really? this is a precursor to grunge. I, I feel like this is a, it's got that eerie, something uh somebody save me and something ain't right it sounds like i i could totally picture Soundgarden doing this and cornell singing this really do i i i i okay. like it it's because it's it really reminds me cake it could have come off a of super unknown well maybe that's uh, the problem maybe 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 i can't believe i'm saying this maybe it's the vocals that maybe it's his delivery no, it's just it does, I, I, it's I not, not as it's, menacing as the music you yeah, know what the I mean? music I think is, and Bruce does an awesome job on the guitar, dark, yeah. eerie. Yes, uh, I, I think this song would have been great on Creatures uh, Carnival Souls. I actually like this a lot. Okay, all right, let's go to next track, Hand of Fate. This was recorded around oh seven oh eight, Sonic Boom era. Recorded again with Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer. Eh, it's okay. It's pretty heavy. It, it's got a wicked, like almost like a Zeppelin kind of like, like God of Thunder within type of stuff. It's heavy. The the chorus is a little bit. Eh. It definitely, definitely could have fit on an album. I mean, I'm not a fan of Sonic Boom. You put this on Sonic Boom. I might freaking think it's the second or third best song on the album. So it's definitely, definitely something here. They could have worked on this. This easily could have been a Kiss song. I think I, I think it's pretty good. Very, very heavy. A Hand of Fate. Gene Simmons. They write. Some of my better songs sought with titles. Through truth, though truthfully, there's simply no rule right or wrong way com- coming up with the song. But when I get the right title, then I know the words feel like. And I used to have a chalkboard where I would write phrases down. For hand of fate, the word love is does not appear. Hand of fate, pearly gates. Oh, that's great. So when these words feel like they belong, be sure to shake when you enter the pearly gates. Be sure to stick your hand out and shake the hands of fate. Yeah, that's right. When it feels right, you just know when the words and the feeling is right. Tommy and Eric, I would fool around a rehearsal studio in L.A., and I came up with the riff chords melody. So afterwards, I showed the guys the changes, and we had our boombox press record. Two or three takes later, had a track. That's us playing live. No overdubs. I went to the pot. It went into the pot for Sonic Boom, but didn't make it. I took the track home, got an engineer, Pat Regan, to bring over some microphones in his small Pro Tool setup. I sang the harmony vocals and rearranged the song. Came out pretty good. I like this one. So do I, Gene. Yeah. Uh, I, I like, <laughs> except for the acapella. Uh, oh yeah, that's in no the good. beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's it's a heavy true. song. It definitely sounds like Red Hot and Sonic Boom. It sounds like I'm an animal a little bit. Uh, he's got the major demon voice going on that song. The hand of fate. Yeah, and I uh, love how he I love how he, he threw it in the pot for Sonic Boom, and Paul was like, "No, we need to put nothing but a good time on." I, I'm sorry, I mean never enough on Sonic Boom instead. <laughs> well, it's not it's not going to be a stand, but it's pretty good. Ah, gee, there you go. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, I like the solo on this one, but let's go to the next one. Hunger came out around 1986. Recorded with Eric Carr and Bruce Kulick in Atlanta. Uh, I think this is pretty cool. I, I, I think I, I, it's got kind of a weird vibe to it. Gene submitted the song for Crazy Nights. Like, once again, shot down by probably Paul, of course. But Gene says, Kiss was in Atlanta, Georgia, around 87, 88, on one of our concert tour stops. I had written a song called Hunger. Bruce Kulick, Eric Carr. Eric Carr and I were invited to a New Year's Eve celebration at a club, which they were holding in our honor. Instead, both Bruce and Eric agreed to go into the studio with me to cut the demo. First, I had the lick, which quickly became the chordal pattern. I'm not sure if the title came to me first or if I saw that David Bowie movie, The Hunger, where he played a vampire. But I always thought the word hunger had weight and gravitas. Then I had a general melody idea. Lyrically, once I had the title, the words came quickly. I hunger for your love, the cliche of all cliches. I always like songs like Good Golly, Miss Molly, 
and Bowie's line in Suffragette City, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Because in the lyrics, they don't use the word love. Whether you're Bad Company or Led Zeppelin with Can't Get Enough of Your Love or A Whole Lot of Love, they're not really talking about love in those songs. They're talking about sex. Hunger is more about that sweaty and wet sex. Yes. <laughs> you. <laughs> um, it's okay. It's it's pro- This demo version is a little bit too bouncy. I don't know if it would have fit on Crazy Nights and kind of rock it up a little bit more, but it, it's okay. The, again, there's something there. There's something there. Hunger, written by Gene Simmons. I've just put it as a straightforward mid-tempo 80s Gene track. Yeah. Uh, I think it sounds like Animalized Side 2. There's yep. a nice little Bruce uh, solo to it there. It's okay, but I, I immediately think of, instead, I think it's Hungry there, but I hunger for your love. I'm almost yeah. human. Right? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's where I think those lyrics come from. But okay. anyways, let's go check out this track, which I think we know. In my head, of course, well, this made it onto Carnival of Souls, one of my favorites. This is a uh, little different, kind of like I confess. I, I, I think this one, I can't tell because I listen to both because I love in my head. Sometimes I listen to this, I'll be like, oh, this one's a little bit more menacing. But then I go back and listen to the actual Carnival of Souls version. I'm like, nah, this one's a little bit more badass. Either way, like I said, with I confess, I love hearing a demo of a song that becomes a song I love. And this is great. In My Head, written by Gene Simmons, Scott Van Zandt, and Jamie St. James, Dime Store D. Snyder. From <laughs> Dime Store. Black it's and an Blue. Ins- it's an insult to dime stores. Yep. Uh, in the book, he writes, when I'm alone, I don't talk a song idea through. It just kind of happens. However, when I sit with a co-writer, it starts with a conversation. In my head, start of the conversation with Tommy Thayer and I, with both of us holding guitars. I think I had an acoustic and he had an electric. And I like a lot of things starts with a melody, a riff, or a line. I start humming. After I heard the riff to for In My Head, I said, let's do some Beatles stuff against those heavy chords. So we recorded backward cymbals. It was done on a 16-track demo in a very small studio. When the track uh, started to happen, I said, lyrically, why don't we talk about these guys who hear voices in their head? You hear about people like Son of Sam who has voices in their heads. It's like a real chemical imbalance and psychological sickness. But I'm always fascinated by the fact that they can be lucid. And talking to you one second, and inside their head, they're hearing other voices. Originally, I wanted to do something like, I hear voices, and I thought it was much more chilling than this, and other world exists in my head. So the lyrics are pretty chilling. I'm obnoxious in no one's uh, home in my head, in my head. Cardboard boxes filled with hate in my head, in my head. They're in my head. Distant termites glowing red in my head. They're in my head. And then I look behind the mask, try to find peace of mind. BD smiles behind dark shades in my head, in my head. You know this kind of imagery, other worlds that coexist along with you being lucid and having conversations with people. The song made it a carnival souls, but I often have separation anxiety when things in my demos don't make it on the record. In some ways, I prefer this demo version in my head, just like the feel of my original demos. I often do. Yeah, I put it's still dark and heavy. Uh, this do- demo version strange there are like strange vocals and background vocals on this one a little more i think than on the actual song on yep. carnival the you know the solo's great on it as well i've always liked this song i liked it on carnivals and i like this version of it yep speaking of carnivals next track carnival of souls number one recorded on ninety three ninety four. I like it. I, I like it's just got like that dun 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 like a Beavis and Butthead type song. And then it has kind of like a melodic, you know, chorus, you know, this carnival of souls, but it's like dun 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 dun. I think it's kind of cool. Could have fit on an easily could have fit on a kiss album somewhere. Uh, but Gene says in the book, the idea was inspired by a low budget movie called Carnival of Lost Souls, a really scary movie from the 50s that I saw as a kid. There's actually also a movie called Carnival of Souls. I always love the idea of a carnival of souls going around and around. When I first sat down with Scott Van Zen, an L.A. based guitar player, to discuss what kind of song I wanted to write, I brought up an obscure L.A. band called Love, fronted by their lead singer, Arthur Lee. They had some success, came out of the L.A. scene at the same time as The Doors. Love never got big enough for the masses, but I love that band and my riff for Carnival of Souls was inspired by a love song. It's not blues, it ain't rock, but it has that kind of ethereal hippie psychedelic vibe. 
I wrote the song with Scott Van Zandt, and as soon as I heard it in my head, the opening line, round and round it goes, this carnival of souls, it just spoke to me, and the rest of the song wrote itself very quickly. I wanted you to hear both recorded versions to hear how the song developed. Number two is on the next disc, I believe. At the time, Kiss, myself, Paul, Bruce Kulik, and Eric Singer, we were in transition. We convinced ourselves we should do a much harder record, less produced, closer to our revenge record. Everybody liked the title Carnival of Souls, but ironically, the song by the same name didn't make it on the album. Carnival Souls, number one, written by Gene Simmons, Scott Van Zandt. I think this is, uh, it. Had, I can't explain, I don't remember the song, Tom, but dun, it begins dun, with dun, a, dun, dun. But it, it sounds like a song that was an opening to video games. I don't remember when from somewhere in the nineties or two thousands. Okay. I'm not sure if it was on Madden or NHL 94. Probably, probably Madden. Dun, 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 let's party something like that. Oh, it's the party hard song by Andrew WK. <laughs> there you go. I don't that's remember it. how it goes, but it's something. Dun, dun. That's it. Was it. Like party opening- hard. That's right, that's what it is. I'm going to have to Google this real quick. It, it's a- Andrew WK party hard. That's it. Yep. Good call. Party hard by Andrew WK. Yep. So I am going to find out where it fucking was on. What video game? Um, I think it was back when Madden had like rock music. Madden 2003. Nice. Yep. That's where it was. I was like, there's something on this. <laughs> I would fuck around and maybe, maybe try to trade players yeah, or yeah. do something. But yeah. I remember that that's what that sounds like in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, and anyways, uh, I, I really like this and I really like when it gets to the chorus. Me too. I fucking love the bridge on this. Yeah. When it's it good. Slows it down. I, I, I wrote like I think that bridge is the first bridge on any of these songs because only Paul does bridges. I'm I'm starting to guess, but that's the first one and it, I, that I picked up on at least yeah. on this album. I fucking love it. I think this song is really catchy and cool, yep. even though it's on Madden 2003. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. All right, Tom. Are you a boy or are you a girl? Yep, so track 12, Are You a Boy or Are You a Girl, recorded around 1988 with Eric Carr on drums, Tommy Thayer on guitar. This is a demo, so Tommy Thayer was part of the party back then. Uh, Lyrics were never finished. You can hear Gene doing a little bit of scat and kind of stuff during the thing. I I like it. So when I hear this, the type of drums and the way the music starts and stops, it reminds me of 90s alternative like girl bands. Like something that like Veruca Salt would do or something. It's like, you know what I mean? Like that kind of dun dun. And then it would like sing and then it'd be like, are you a bull? And it's like, dun, dun, dun. I don't know. I, I think it's real catchy. It definitely doesn't sound like anything Kiss would ever put on one of their albums. But I, I, I thought it was really cool. I liked it a lot. I was kind of surprised that Gene would do something like this. Are you a boy? Or are you a girl? By Gene Simmons. That was the title by a 60s group called The Barbarians. I decided yep. to write my own song with that title, but that is fairly common. This Fire by Bruce Springsteen, Fire by Jimi Hendrix. They're completely different songs. If you had long hair in the 60s, all the construction guys would say, hey, get a haircut, kid. What are you, a boy or a girl? Make up your mind. As soon as the straight guys started growing their hair, like the Beatles, the guys who adored the culture of the Rat Pack made fun of them. People used to get beaten up for having long hair. So the line, are you a boy, are you a girl, for some long-haired creature from another world, felt like a song. I never got a chance to completely finish the song. On this demo, you hear the chords, my basic scat singing. I made up lyrics on the spot. As for the chords themselves, I made, I used classic rock and uh, roll chord progression, C, A minor, F, G, which Paul Revere and the Raiders also used on their song, uh, Just Like Me. Are You a Boy, Are You a Girl was recorded with Eric Carr on drums, Tommy Thayer on guitar. Tommy was not yet in Kiss at this point. So I believe this is uh, eighty around 88. Yep. I said that this song feels like it, it belongs on Incesticide by Nirvana. Oh, there you go. That too. Yep. Okay. It, I'm like, again, another it's precursor like, it's like, to grunge. It's like a pop Simple pop lyrics. Song. Simple lyrics and then that repetitive chorus that Nirvana yes. and other bands would just, you know what I'm talking about, those yeah. incesticide yes. type songs or songs off of Bleach. 
those type of songs. And they got into a little bit on In Utero, not so much on Nevermind. But yep. that that song, lyric, lyric, just get to the chorus and repeat the chorus in a, in a nice, easy, kind of simple punk pop melodies. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And there's like a bass solo on this. That's weird. Boom, yeah. Boom, 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 yep. boom. <laughs> I like it. I think it's a pretty cool song. All right. Next track. Say You Don't Want It. Now, this comes around the late 90s. This is another version of a song that we have been waiting almost 300 episodes <laughs> to talk about. But I like it. It's catchy. We'll talk a little bit more about it when we get to the next track. But in the book, he says, say you don't want it, use the same riff as Mongoloid Man, which appears right after this on the vault. I wrote and recorded Mongoloid Man in 79, and I always liked that riff. In 2001, I wanted to update it and get rid of the Mongoloid Man lyric and thought maybe Kiss would record it. So Tommy and I went into a studio and recorded Say You Don't Want It and try to do a modern version on that. Now, we have also some conflicting information that yeah. says it was done in 97. Gene um, says it was in 2001. Now, the notes we have here saying that Gene made a mistake suggesting mm-hmm. the song was demoed in 2001. So I don't know who you want to believe. Either, other than that, I love how it has a sleazy groove to it. Um, and I like the chorus here. Say you don't want it. I, again, it's weird. I, I don't know where this would go on a Kiss album. I'm not sure, but I like it. But I'm more interested to talk about the original version of it when we get to it. Say you don't want it written by Gene Simmons. I have the same notes about maybe being in 97. And it's actually the same riff, obviously, as Mongoloid Man. But another song that Gene did when he was in Bullfrog Beer. Yep. The precursor to Kiss, and he called that one Daily Planet. Yes. So you can find that on YouTube. You can click and you can get that. Uh, but I was like, why is he doing a David Lee Roth? A skiddly be little bop 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 bop. It's so funny. Yeah, he fucking just. Billy Billy Bop 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 I know. Uh, but I like this. It's kind of like a laid back sleazy. Ooh, yeah, it's got a weird groove. Yeah, I like it. I agree. But it's but it it works. It works. I like how I like how he did steal some lyrics from uh, which I think it, I think it went on to spit when he's like I you know I got no manners and I'm not too clean. I think that's the not first. That's the, that's the opening line of you gotta, spit. You got to do that part too. And not uh, too clean. Hold on, we'll do that in a minute. All right, here it is. Kiss Tards, all for you. Mongoloid Man is alive and well in the world of Shout It Out Loudcast. Oh, my goodness. Okay, now, the very first time I heard this was on a ride home from work. And holy fuck, was I not disappointed. (laughs) This is what a just revelation this song is we've been talking about this goofing on this title forever (laughs) it's funny because you got joe perry on guitar you got our buddy and former guest of the show michael debar doing backing vocals mongoloid (laughs) i'm i'm gonna tell you right now it's a mongoloid man um yeah some of the lyrics were used on spit i mentioned that before I'm sorry, I can't get this fucking song out of my head. <laughs> it is the ultimate earworm. He's a mongoloid, mongoloid, mongoloid. I can't get my, I can't get out of my fucking head. Oh, mongoloid man, Gene, written by Gene Simmons. I don't think anybody else is getting or wants to take a writing credit for this. But anyways, he writes in '79. I was living in Malibu. I was in a relationship. The lady owned the house there. While I was in her house, I think this is Cher. He's talking about. Yeah, I started riffing on a guitar and she kept saying, and, and wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. This is 79. Th- he did this on the uh, 78. He did. Th- th- this is going to be on the solo album. Yes. So he's wrong here. Since 79, I was living there. Yeah, he's, he's wrong again. Yeah. I started riffing on guitar. And she kept saying, what the hell is that? I said, I got a great idea. It's called mongoloid man <laughs> and she said well that's not nice you can't write a song using those words i said but it's cool mongoloid man i do what i can yeah because i'm a mongoloid man yeah mongoloid a mongoloid it sings great i didn't mean it to be not nice mongoloid man was recorded fast with yours truly on guitar and bass 
Uh, Michael DeBar comes down to the studio and sings background. I think around that time at dinner with the Aerosmith guys, I turned to Joe Perry and said, hey, want to come to the studio tomorrow and play a solo? He said, sure. In those days, life was simpler. We didn't have many lawyers torturing us. It was as simple as the two guys who wanted to work in the studio together. I'm like embarrassed for Michael DeBar and Joe no. Perry. Can you imagine them? They're like, they were stars then. Hey, come, I got a song I want you to play on tomorrow. Okay, how's this going to go? Okay. I'm a mongoloid man. They must have I been can, dude. I'm not fucking singing this shit. Dude, I, I, it's the first thing I thought of was, should we tag Michael when we put this on social media? And I thought, fuck yeah, because I want to see if he comments on it. Yeah, so we talked to him about it. We asked him about yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Laugh. Mongoloid when he was rolling his eyes. Oh, yeah. About you. Uh, you know, he come. Joe Perry does a great solo on this. That's He's awesome. Backing vocals on this. Mongoloid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's that weird, like girlish kind of vo- vocals that Kiss has done in all throughout the 70s yeah. on some tracks, like the original version of God of Thunder. It's like a Wicked Lester type of sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, they've had it on some of these. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow, and tonight. It's like girlish child kind of vocals. I don't oh, know. Oh, oh. Here's, here's another one. Night boy, I want to <laughs> be your night boy. Yeah, that shit. Yeah, I, I fucking I can't believe Debar hits this out of the park. But it's I can't. Awesome. Be, but he's singing. <laughs> but he's doing such a great job with the backing vocal. But he must be like. Mongoloid, Mongoloid. <laughs> like, what am I doing? What the I fuck, love, it. I love, it. I love it. Um, and Gene has a wicked demon voice on this. Oh, it's yeah, it, it's it's. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Anyways, <laughs> let's end on the final track. I wait. Recorded in April of two thousand two, uh, based on a demo that was originally written by Darren Leader, who became the drummer. For Steel Panther, Gene says, I wait started as a song written by Darren Leader. Yep, Steel Panther. He sat down and played me his demo. When I got involved, I added a bridge and a chorus. So for I wait, I put Darren's name first in the writing credit because the heart and soul of the song was his. The general lyric appealed to me. I've always been attracted to the loner, the outsider, how you can live in the big city and still feel like you're completely alone. There's no one here, and the person saying that is waking up in a city that's got millions of people. It's off the beaten path musically, but I like the aesthetic of it. I wrote some of the lyric, and I added the chorus, which was inspired by the chordal pattern for Magical Mystery Tour by the Beatles, in the way those chords worked. Haunting refrain of I wait and I wait and I wait really got me. I think this is pretty good. Uh, This kind of reminds me... It's definitely not a Kiss song. It's not even really a Gene song. This reminds me of like, if like some '90s like alt band or or like a uh, po- like a like a post grunge band did like a ballad. That's what it kind of sounds like. Something like a Three Doors Down or like you know one of those kind of like mid to late '90s bands. It's it's okay. I, I like it just because I think it shows a different side of Gene that we don't get to see a lot. But I don't think there's any way this would have ever really fit on a Kiss album. But I like it. I, I like the effort at least. I wait written by Darren letter and Gene Simmons, uh, around circa 2002. I fucking absolutely love this song. Yeah. I put, it's a great 90 songs, collective soul, yep. gin blossoms. There you go. And yes. Even, even Nirvana unplugged. Yep. If you sing in the chorus, I'm a, I can totally picture Cobain. I always, I am dude, belting that out in, in the unplugged setting. Dude, I always laugh how me and you never talk about this stuff, but there are certain things we exactly find the same things on. The, like, we totally agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. The It's such a 90s tune. The bridge in the chorus that he kind of did in the pre-chorus stuff are the best part of this fucking song. Yeah. The other part of the beginning part is a very 90s type song pattern and lyrics. And it, yeah, I could totally tell Collective Soul, things like that. We're doing this. But man... I was super impressed. This is a great song. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good. Right. I don't know where it would fit on a Kiss album. Right. But Tom, that's 15 tracks. Overall thoughts. So one thing that really stood out to me that I wanted to save until the end of all the tracks was that you notice whose name never appears on any of these 15 tracks. 
Paul that would Stanley. Be me, Paul, Paul Stanley. Paul, Paul Stanley. Nope. Mm-hmm. Everything is Tommy, Bruce, Eric Singer, Eric Carr, all these people. Paul is not part of any of this, which I just thought was really, really interesting. Um, but that aside, I enjoyed it. I'm not going to lie. I like this. I mean, it's, is it something that I'm going to listen to all the time? I don't know, but these were all semi formed songs. Like I, I, the, the shit that's on the box set is, is terrible. Like I said, Lita stop, look to listen, keep me wait. Some of that other shit, like that's like, that's some of this stuff is good. Now, again, that's wicked Lester. That's 60, 70s. Some of this stuff was written in the eighties, nineties and beyond. So yeah, we I haven't like gotten it. to that point yet. Where right, we're doing right, right. And we, and we will. And we will. I think the um, earliest of the like late seventies. Yeah. But that being said, I liked it. I, I think there's some good stuff and some of it's much better than others, but I enjoyed listening to it. Tom, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I really like this. Yeah. Um, I think it's a very good album. Me too. I, I wish. What What's tough is we can't put this as a ranking. No. Against the non kiss albums. Nope. Because there's 15 of them. What are we going to. The only thing we're going to be able to do is rank the discs against each other for the box set. Yeah, exactly. But I will tell you, I would put this up there, maybe top three. Top three what? Of all the non-Kiss albums. Really? Yeah. Actually, you know what? Why why am I surprised by that? We've reviewed some shit. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. right. So I I think this album's great. I don't know how many Kiss songs are in here, but there are some really good songs. And I've always gotten to the point where I'm like... Yeah, ah, Gene's gonna write some shit. Yeah, he's got some shit, but generally speaking, it's good. I always talk about Paul doing stuff, but Gene is right there. I mean, I, I think like that, all these songs. There's not really that many. Oh, this song sucks. You bring up a good point. Usually, everybody like like boasts about Paul, and you know, for rightfully so. I think Gene does himself justice here. I'm wondering if that's why he opened it up with this disc with this disc yeah i don't know we haven't i honestly guys i haven't listened to the rest of the disc me neither i started with this 15 tracks a lot of tracks for me to learn that are new to try to do that with all the other shit going on in our lives and arc albums that i gotta learn i don't have time to fucking put on 150 songs and learn them all at the same time right so we'll get to disc two soon but yeah tom what we do next is we rank these songs yeah this was fun yeah all right um you want to go first? Yeah, uh, I'm going to start with Legends Never Die at 15. Whoa, really? Yep. Never got oh. into it. Just don't, don't like it. All right. Um, but do you hate it? No, I don't hate it. That's my point. 15 yeah. songs and you don't hate anything. No, I don't. That's very rare for us. Exactly. Uh, yep. 15 for me is Juliet. Juliet. Okay. Okay. Uh, 14 for me is something wicked this way comes. Oh man. Yeah. We might be all over the place. Hey, maybe. Yeah, we definitely are. Okay. Um, 14 is hunger. Okay. Uh, 13 for me is Juliet. 13 for me is he's a mongoloid man. Mongoloid. Mongoloid. Okay. 12 for me is hand of fate. 12 for me. Are you a boy or? Are you a girl? Okay. 11 for me is Hey You. Hey You. That's my 11. Okay. Maybe if that thing had real drums, the drum machine really fucks it up for me. Uh, number like 10. The, the, the production on it, too, sounds like a very demo. Yeah, oh, yeah. It sounds yeah, like uh, a clean song. Yep. Yep. A 10 for me is Hunger. All right. 10 for me is Say You Don't Want It. Okay. Number nine for me is I Wait. Oh, man. Uh, nine. Hand of fate. Okay. Number eight. Say you don't want it. Dun, 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 dun. Eight for me. Legends never die. Oh, okay. Seven for me. Turn to stone. Okay. All right. Uh, seven for me. Something wicked this way comes. Oh, okay. I like that alternative grungy kind of okay. sound garden-ish. Number six, are you a boy? <laughs> hey, boy. Hey, look, boy. You look about cute in them jeans. <laughs> After I finish him, you next. Stay out of my way. Don't turn your back on me, punk. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
He was the best is like, why was he such a dick to Apollo Creed? I never understood that. Because he was just a dick. <laughs> he got so much just to shake his hand at the beginning of the first fight. Yeah. Like, get ahead. I don't want no has been messing in my corner. And you better get that bad look off your face before I knock it off. That's right. Has one jump. 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 Creed. jump. Creed. Come on. Creed. Come on. Come on. Creed. Come on, Creed. Come on, he says it. He's just like on, asking Creed. him like such a dick. I love it. Like, dude, I think that's one of the best fucking lines. You better get that bad look off your face. Your face oh, I love it. Oh, man. He's the best bully of all oh, time. One of the best. All right. Yep. Number six for me is turn to stone. Okay. Number five for me. I can't believe I have it ranked this high, but I can't get out of my head. He's a mongoloid man. <laughs> mongoloid. <laughs> Mongoloid. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe you. what's the matter with me. So you have a podcast. What do you discuss? What do we discuss music. Like what was the latest song you discussed? A song called <laughs> Mongoloid Man. <laughs> and then the person like, oh, Mongoloid. Mongoloid. <laughs> <laughs> Our next book is going to be, we're going to have uh It'll be called Mongoloid Man, Gene Simmons Vault. Oh, yeah. Is that the one with the Brendan O'Brien remix version? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Mongoloid Man? What yep. the fuck are we doing, people? Uh, yep. Anyways, number five for me, Carnival Souls 1. Okay. Uh, that's my number four. Uh, number four for me, In My Head. And that is my number three. Why don't you just tell me the name of number three? <laughs> exactly. Number three for me is I Confess. And that is my number two. Number two for me is... I ain't lying. They're gonna stick it with the with sun, the don't, sun shine. don't shine. <laughs> and that's my number one. Are you ready? Is my number one. You like that, huh? I love it. I think it's a ripping song. That should be like the theme for like Monday Night Football. I love it. Well, Tom, my number one is a song you never probably would have thought of, and that's "I Wait." I'm not surprised. I fucking love that song. I, I can't. I, I can't. I'm so happy that that song came into my world and yeah. uh, and you know for years i didn't buy the the fucking the vault and stuff but yep. i went and got the like five four hundred five hundred dollar edition whatever it is and i'm so thankful i got it if you guys can we just even on the first one get the fucking music it's so yeah. worth it it's so yep. worth it. i agree it's great it's really good in the book the book itself just an incredible oh, collector's item. item great great yep. Great, great yep. stuff, as you yep. can tell. Yep. And hopefully we don't get sued by Gene, and we'll be on next week, and we'll find out soon enough, right? Hopefully. Tom, what we do next is we go to question of the week. Yeah, our question of the week comes from a comment that we had previously read from our buddy Ryan Michael Ramaswamy, <laughs> Spencer <laughs> Hook, Rodham, Clinton, Nixon, Milhouse, <laughs> Homer Simpson, Scott. <laughs> How do you think Kiss would be in terms of popularity and or a following without all the merch? Hmm. Zeus, you you start with this one, my friend. I think they. So it's it's hard to say. Are you still saying they're wearing makeup? Sure. Yeah. Just uh, pr pretend everything existed. Just no merch. Uh, I believe they would be probably about the same because for as much as they would lose from the hardcore collectors they get might get more credibility because i still think they get shit for being oh they're just selling shit a cartoon oh they're just a kids band so for as much as they would lose by not having the serious collectors that are kissed hards they might gain more people by being more respectful and more uh accessible more on the radio because they don't do that shit and you can't mock them for being Oh, it's just a kid's band. It's a great point. And I'm not going to disagree with you. I just don't know if by the time the merch became so huge around 77, 78, people had started kind of started to kind of get a little bit sick of the, the act and the shtick and the makeup. So it, you bring up a good point. I, but I will say this. I, I, I think other than star Wars, there's so very few things that are more identifiable with merch in the seventies. And I, I don't, I don't know what, it, I mean, you say it would have brought in all those hardcore fans if they didn't do it. I say it would have lost a ton of fans that were introduced to the band because of the merch. So I think there's kind of like a push pull. Um, yeah. Me personally, I think it would have hurt the band. It sounds like you probably think it would have helped them, but I think either, either argument I think is, is a good one. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for the question there, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, where can people find us? Our website, shoutitoutloudcast.com. That's you can find all of our episodes, all of our KISS episodes, Dorm Damage, Album Review Crew, Zeppelin Chronicles. You can find links to our Amazon shopping, links to our merch page. There's a link right on the landing page to the website to buy our amazing kick-ass KISS book, Raise Your Glasses, right there. And you can find it on Amazon. And on our website also, you can find links to all of our social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Threads. You can find links to our Patreon. Again, thank you to all our wonderful Patreon people. And you can also use that website to comment or ask questions or whatever. And we get those in the form of an email, which is shoutoutloudcast at gmail.com. And if you want your question of the week read, we do one every week. And we also do a mailbag episode. Please get your questions in. We prefer email, but just like Ryan Michael Scott did, he said a comment on Facebook. So whatever you choose, we just want more questions from you guys to keep you guys involved so please do that and as always we like to say that we are a proud member of the pantheon podcast network of shows tom people can dm us on twitter facebook instagram threads tiktok motherfucker check out our spotify playlist that's where you can uh find all our stuff for certain episodes where we rank albums or songs or give different things for uh uh, ARC or dorm damage, or even our main shout out loudcast. You got to search for our profile on Spotify, not the actual podcast. And unfortunately there'll be no playlist this week because you can only <laughs> yeah. get, you can only, you can only get the vault with the vault. It's not available anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and so subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's a big help to us. Uh, go to YouTube, subscribe, listen to our podcast there. You want to hear the songs, you won't be able to hear them on that YouTube channel. That's when you subscribe to the podcast portion of this uh, show. So anyway, you could do that and give us one of those five star child reviews and go to Amazon and give our book, Raise Your Glasses, a five star review. That moves us up in front of the, uh, more eyes and helps the book out and helps us out tremendously, which we thank you for and appreciate it. So go to Shout It Out Loudcast. You can buy the Raise Your Glasses book there. You can look at our rankings. You can look at all our information. There's tons of stuff to do on our website, shoutitoutloudcast.com. What we always do is we end on famous last words. Do you have any? Of course I do. Okay. Feels right. Feels good. Given to pleasure, babe. I think you should. Just a touch. Ain't too much. They say you're good. But I'll be the judge. Oh, wow. yeah, Gene. Oh, yeah, Gene. Because I'm a mongoloid man. He's a mongoloid man. I do what I can. Mongoloid. Mongoloid. A mongoloid man. Man. He's a mongoloid man. I do what I can. Mongoloid. Mongoloid. <laughs> He's a mongoloid man. Love it. Mongoloid. Mongoloid. So good. Tom. Kiss Army. Loudcasters. Mongoloid Mantards. Thank you. Guys, you're the best. Thank you so much for everything. Please, if you haven't picked up a copy of Raise Your Glasses, do it now. Thank you. And Zeus, as always, my friend, thank you. Peace out, Girl Scout. Hit the music. I'd like now is for all you fat, out of shape, worldwide kiss cards to keep the noise down while I show your ladies what a real sexy man looks like. Listen, all you people out there sitting on rented furniture, settle down. Cut the music. Anybody see Richie? Anybody know why Richie did Bobby Lupo?